Today, I'm going to introduce you to Bass Reeves. A lawman suggested to be the model for the Lone Ranger. Let's hope this talk will be a stepping stone for a Reeves addition to the perennial list of subjects for Black History Month. Although I personally bristle at that term, I'd prefer that American history wasn't segregated by skin culture or country of origin, but this is where we are now. Relax as I hope to entertain you with some storytelling. Our hero, Bass Reeves, the first black US deputy marshal west of the Mississippi was undoubtedly the most effective marshal and possibly lawman in American history. He never lost a single fugitive, capitalizing on the tendency for white men to underestimate him. He consistently outsmarted outlaws to their peril. He believed so strongly in upholding the law that he arrested his own son for murder. Always conscious of his image, Reeves helped create his own legend through his signature appearance, riding high in the saddle on a white stallion. Bass Reeves was born enslaved in 1838 in a shack on the Reeves Plantation in Arkansas. When the son of Bass's owner, young master George, picked him out of other field laborers to become his personal service, he changed Bass's life. When George left to fight with the Confederate Army in the Civil War, he took Bass with him. Legend has it that while the soldiers were encamped, Bass beat up George after a card game. The punishment for a black man, enslaved or free, for just threatening a white man, let alone striking him, was death. So Bass hightailed it out of there. Others say that rumors of freedom propelled his escape. His life with the Confederate troops was hard. He could have been killed at any time because the enslaved were not allowed to carry guns. His job was to take care of his master by the campfire and in the heat of battle. I don't doubt that he carried at least a knife or an ax for his own defense. However it happened, Bass escaped from the Confederate lines to seek refuge with the Seminole and Creek tribes in Florida, like many others fleeing enslavement. While he lived among the native tribes, he perfected his skill with weapons. He practiced firing pistols until he was deadly accurate. Reeves horn honed the quick draw with both his right hand and his left to become a double threat. He invented his own pistol tricks. In a word, he became a deadly, accurate, fancy gunslinger. Bass left Florida after the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. He wandered around a bit until he settled in Arkansas. There he married his wife and started his family, which would eventually grow to 10 kids. At some point, his reputation as a marksman reached US Deputy Marshal James Fagan. So in 1875, Fagan came calling to recruit Reeves to the US Deputy Marshals. Fagan also believed that Reeves' proficiency in several tribal languages made him an ideal candidate to enforce the law in Indian territory. He had detailed knowledge of late Native American tribes, their languages, and the geography of the territory. And he was a deadly accurate shot. What more could you ask? At the time, Indian territory was completely lawless. Thieves, murderers, and all kinds of criminals running from the law fled to Indian territory in the West. As a US deputy, 
Reeves rode the Oklahoma Territory in search of suspects named in his warrants. He traveled with a chuck wagon and cook, a native tribesman, a guard, at least one posse man, and a tumbleweed wagon to transport captives. A tumbleweed wagon looks like a box on wheels with barred wi windows inserted. This one is an example from Wyoming territory. On the road for months at a time, he covered the area between Fort Reno, Fort Seal, and Anadarka in Oklahoma, about an 1800 mile trip. You can see here, uh -oh. where is my pointer? Okay, you can see here, uh, the territory outline, there's Fort Reno at the top, and then Anadarka is in the middle, and Fort Sill is at the bottom of the circle. Originally defined, Indian Territory was, quote, all of that part of the United States west of the Mississippi and not within the states of Missouri and Louisiana or, or the territory of Arkansas, end quote. It was soon restricted to the present state of Oklahoma, except the Panhandle and which is out on the map to the left, noted as public lands, and Greer County. The Choctaw, Creek, Seminole, Cherokee, and Chickasaw tribes were forcibly moved to this area between 1830 and 1843. An act effective June 30th, 1834, set aside the land as Indian country later called Indian Territory. In 1866, the western half of Indian Territory was ceded to the United States, which opened part of it to white settlers in 1889. On the map, that's designated as public lands. Uh, this portion became the territory of Oklahoma in 1890 and eventually encompassed all the lands ceded in 1866. At six foot two inches tall, Bass presented an imposing figure. He was rumored to be superhuman, to have superhuman strength. To give you an idea of how strong the lawman was, he single-handedly pulled a steer buried up to its neck out of the mud. The cowpokes, huffing and puffing from their failed efforts, cheered his success. And then they spread the story to everyone around, in saloons and farmhouses, at night around hearths and campfires under the open skies. Towering over his tall white steed, topped with a large brimmed white hat on his head, Reeves' distinctive look helped grow his legend. He took great pride in his appearance. Always a snappy dresser, Bass kept his boots polished to a high shine. No easy task on the dusty Western plains. Two Colt pistols, handles forward, always sat holsters at his side. He was known as a quick draw who could kill a man dead with either hand. Now, keep in mind, if his hat started out white, it didn't stay that way for long. It actually didn't make much sense to wear white clothes when people rode around dusty plains and slept on the ground. I don't know who was doing the Lone Ranger's laundry on the TV show, but it probably wasn't a warrior like Kanto. That's for sure. Given the vast territory, Reeves was forced to carry several prisoners at a time. Thus, his tumbleweed wagon. Over the course of a long journey, 
Bass wasn't above trying to show his prisoners the light. After the evening meal, he would preach the Bible to his captives in and around the wagon, encouraging them to repent their ways. The extended trips gave prisoners a chance to dream up escape plans. They grasped at the slightest opening, like the time a skunk wandered into camp and stopped next to Bass as he napped. Handcuffed to the wagon, they captured outlaws through rocks at the skunk hoping to provoke it, provoke it to spray the marshal. Bass woke up quietly and didn't flinch. He reached out gently and stroked the skunk. Now, is this legend or fact, or maybe a bit of both? You choose. Ironically, being a black lawman proved to be an advantage on the frontier. Most white men thought the formerly enslaved were subservient and dumb. They were confident they could outsmart them. Sometimes they simply, simply bullied black men. Others, they killed them outright. Mostly they took advantage of them whenever they could. On the other hand, they tended to be suspicious of other white men. That made it easier for Bass to surprise, overpower, and take them down. And Deputy Reeves was cunning. His appearance was so well known that he often used disguises to capture his fugitives. His arrests were also innovative. His exploits made great stories that could be told over and over again. Part of his fame was that he always got his man. Because the territory was so big, Bass returned to his tied up prisoners at the end of his journeys to collect the bounties. Chance meetings with strangers during these trips provided ample opportunity to retell the stories and spread the deputy's fame. Both outlaws and settlers came to know the legend of Bass Reeves. Now Bass never learned to read or write. Of course, before the war, it had been illegal to teach the enslaved to do either. Afterwards, he had to make a living with no time for schooling. But he got around his illiteracy by using his exceptional memory to memorize his warrants so that he could ensure that others read them correctly. In fact, Few people in the West had learned to read. When no one who could read was around, Bass just pretended to read the words he had memorized. When the marshal returned to Fort Smith to collect his bounties, he would often spend time with his wife and kids before heading out again to make enough money to support his growing family. After all, he must have done must have been doing something right to get those 10 kids. After his wife died in 1896, the marshal transferred his headquarters from Fort Smith in Arkansas to the Muskegee Federal Court within Oklahoma, Indiana Territory. In 1900, he married again. So you can see out from this map that alcohol that Arkansas is to the right, um, and uh, Fort Sill is uh, quite near the border and uh, not terribly far from Anadarka. One of the tales about the marshal takes him into the home of two outlaws he was chasing. Imagine. Bass leaves his crew and native companion 25 miles away from the house where the two outlaws are hiding with their mother. He's wearing old shoes, dirty clothes, and carrying a cane, so unlike his usual well-kept appearance. He walks to the house disguised as this tramp because he doesn't want to take the chance that the woman might recognize him by reputation. After all, a black lawman on a big white stallion wearing a big hat is an unusual sight to say the least. When he arrives, 
he pleads that his weary feet are just killing him. And he asks the woman to let him rest a while. He tells her that he is trying to escape a posse himself. She can easily see the three bullet holes in his hat. He tells her they are the work of the posse, poking his finger through one. She doesn't know that the marshal shot the hat himself. She lets him in and asks him to share a drink and a meal. While she's cooking, she brags about the escapades of her two sons. The woman suggests that Bass, well, might want to join them because they're doing pretty well. As the sun is setting, he invites Bass to stay the night. While Bass is settling down, he hears a sharp whistle and watches the mother go outside to answer it. In no time at all, two men appear inside. The sons entertain the stranger with tales of their crimes as they pass around a bottle. Eventually, they all settle down in their bedrolls to sleep. As the pair sleep, Bass quickly jumps up, handcuffs them without waking them, no doubt the effect of the drink. Then he kicks them awake and hustles them out the door. The mother runs as fast as she can after the trio for about three miles before she finally gives it up. Bass marches the duo back to his camp. When he arrives back at the fort weeks later, he collects his $500 reward. There are lots of other stories about the invincible marshal. Several times he used this trick with a letter. A couple of murderers he's tracking happen to see him on the road. They ask him if he's the famous colored marshal, Bass Reeves. He denies it. They don't believe him, or maybe they just don't want to take a chance. They force him at gunpoint to ride along with them until they can find someone to identify him. When they don't find anybody after a time, their patience wears thin. They figure they'll just shoot him. So they order him off his horse. When they ask him if he got any last words, he starts whimpering. With trembling hands, he gives them a letter to read from his wife. He's fooled them into thinking he's scared to death when of course he's just acting. While the men's attention is focused on reading the letter, they drop their guard. Lightning quick, fast jaws his gun and shoots the outlaw holding the letter. Completely surprised, the other man drops his gun, falls to his knees and surrenders. With that, Reeves got both his men. At one point, Reeves himself was charged with murder. In 1887, he stood trial for the murder of a posse cook. Hanging judge Isaac Park, Parker presided over the trial. The judge knew and admired Bass. The marshal had dragged a lot of outlaws into his court to, race, to face justice. The judge knew that life in Oklahoma territory was violent. He'd seen it firsthand in his courtroom. The U.S. Attorney, W.H.H. H. Clinton, another friend of Reeves, presented his defense. Everybody around was betting a black man before Judge Parker would soon be swinging from a tree. But in the end, Bass was acquitted, perhaps because the judge realized how important Bass had been to law enforcement in the territory. In 1884, Jim Webb, on the run from the law for two weeks, jumped out the window of Bayswater store and ran for his horse, a rifle and revolver in his hands when he heard Rees was looking for him. Bass, seated in his, side, in his saddle, watched Webb and called for him to give up. But Webb didn't stop. Reeves had captured him before, only to have him escape from jail. But it's tough for a man on foot to outrun a horse. So in desperation, Webb stopped and turned to shoot his rifle. 
The bullet grazed Bass's saddle, saddle horn. His next shot took a button off the marshal's coat. When the next shot tore the reins from his hand, Bass dove off his horse. As he rolled to get to his feet, the next bullet tore through the brim of his hat. Those four were the last shots Webb ever fired. Bass hit Webb with two rounds from his Winchester rifle. As he lay dying, Webb told the marshal that he had an eye to making the lawman his 12th victim. He handed his pistol over to Bass out of respect. Bass took Webb's boots and gun belt for proof of capture after he buried his body nearby. In 1889, after Reese was assigned to Paris, Texas, he went across the, he went after the horse thieves known as the Tom Story Gang. Bass waited along the route that the gang was known to use and surprised Tom with a warrant. The outlaw panicked and drew his gun, but Reeves drew faster and shot him dead. The rest of the gang disbanded and were never heard from again. Those types of confrontation were unusual for Bass. He was hesitant to kill when he didn't have to. Those types of confrontation were rare. He commonly used his gun sparingly, mostly in self-defense. He much preferred chicory and stealth. Like the time he pretended to be a farmer. He rents a team of scrawny oxen in a rundown wagon, which he intentionally runs over a tree stump near an outlaw's hideout. They rushed out to help with a wag wagon, anxious to get the stranger away from their hideout as quickly as possible. Just as they free the wagon, Bass whips out his pistols. Once they know it's Marshall Reeves though, the four unarmed outlaws surrender. As a legend of Bass Reeves grew over the years, word that he held a an outlaw's warrant prompted some of them to surrender rather than fight. Among them was the notorious bandit queen, Belle Starr. At one time, she'd worked with Jesse James. She was, by all accounts, a hardened criminal, one of the meanest women in the territory. But when she heard Reeves held her warrant, it was the first and only time she made it her business to locate him and turn herself in, in 1886. Others elected to flee. When Hullaby Sammy heard that Marshall Reeves was in town, he rode out of Indian territory as fast as he could. His black stallion managed to outrun the marshal's sorrel. But Bass was a patient man. He never gave up on a warrant. He knew he would cross paths with Sammy on another day. And so he did. And then he got his man. One of the high points of Reeves' career was the apprehension of the notorious outlaw Bob Dozier. Dozier was a thief of many talents, from cattle and horse rustling to robberies of banks and stores and stagecoaches. His gang wasn't above murder and lance rentals either. Dozier's unpredictably, unpredictability made him a tough catch, although many lawmen had tried to apprehend him. None was successful until Reeves. Dozier eluded him for several months until the lawman tracked him down in the Cherokee Nation. After refusing to surrender, Reeves killed Dozier in a gunfight on December 20th, 1878. Over two decades later, the marshal faced a tough decision. When an arrest warrant was issued in 1902 for his son, Benny, the charge was murdering his wife. The bad news greeted him when Bass returned to deliver two prisoners to Muskogee. All the other marshals had left the warrant. 
too afraid to pursue it. As a dedicated lawman, Reeves decided that no man was above the law, not even his son. He would capture Benny himself and bring him back to face trial. Two weeks later, he'd gotten his man. At the trial, Benny was convicted and sentenced to life in Leavenworth Prison in Kansas. Black men usually receive quick trials and harsh sentences. In fact, Benny was lucky to escape hanging for murder. It's a testament to Bass's reputation and influence that the younger Reeves was not sentenced to death. The fact that Benny's victim was his own wife probably helped too. Black people killing other Black people was less important, particularly when the victim was a wife. But it was the citizens' respect for the lawman that brought them to sign a petition for pardon quite extraordinarily in that period of time. Benny was pardoned for good behavior as a result. He remained a law-abiding citizen for the rest of his life. I don't have any information on whether he remained unmarried though. I don't know, you'd think a woman might be a little shy. Reeves was suspected for his honesty, was respected for his honesty. No better demonstrated than by the arrest of his own son. son. He could not be bribed or corrupted. Respected, but also feared because he was crafty and could be deadly. But he was still a black man, hated for just being that. Perhaps even worse, because he wore a badge. Maybe it was just different when he was looking down from his horse. He was, after all, an imposing six-foot figure riding tall in the saddle. He was one of the fastest guns in the West. He could shoot with two pistols. So when he rode up on an angry mob, lynching a man on the prairie, he didn't say a word. They knew who he was. He rode into the midst of the crowd, cut the man down to land on the back of his horse and rode away. The crowd stood silent and then dispersed. The territory of Oklahoma swallowed up Indian territory in the Eastern part of the state to be admitted to the Union as the state of Oklahoma in 1907. When state agencies took over law enforcement within their domain, Reeves retired after 32 years from the US Deputy Marshal's office, the only man left of the original lawman. He was the longest serving deputy US Marshal. He killed only 14 men in the line of duty out of over 3000 criminals that he'd arrested without ever being wounded by a bullet. He was the most effective lawman that the territory had ever seen and probably in history. Unwilling to just take it easy or maybe unable to afford it, he joined the Muscogee, Oklahoma police as a patrolman. Reeves can be seen, again, with the slide, there it is. Reeves can be seen in the front row of this photo of the Muskegee, Oklahoma police on the left with the cane. Bass is ill at this point with symptoms of Bright's disease, a terminal illness of the kidneys. It's worth noting that all of the black officers are on the front row, a reminder that at this time, 1908 was an Oklahoma was enacting increasingly strict black code laws. Already, schools had been segregated in 1897. By 1908, railroad and streetcars had separate cars for blacks and whites, and marriage became illegal between a person of African descent and anyone who wasn't. The punishment was a fine of up to $500 and imprisonment for up to five years. Maybe it was his record in law enforcement that prevented a single crime from being committed in Reeves patrol area during the two years he was on the force. 
But by 1909, Rees was bedridden. He died on January 12, 1910. And an Oklahoma City newspaper article in 1907 summarized lawlessness in their age. Quote, 80 miles west of Smart Fort Smith was known as the deadline. And whenever a deputy marshal from Smart Fort Smith or Paris, Texas, crossed the Missouri, Kansas, or Kentucky or Texas track, he took his own life in his hands and he knew it. On nearly every trail would be found posted by outlaws a small card warning certain deputies that if, he, if they ever crossed the deadline, they would be killed. Reeves has a dozen of these cards, which were posted for his special benefit. And in those days, such a notice was no idle boast. And many an outlaw has bitten the dust trying to ambush a deputy on these trails. End quote. Reeves was inducted into the Hall of Great Westerners at the National Cowboy and Western and Western Heritage Museum in Oklahoma City in 1992. So there he is, our hero, Bass Reeves a dedicated lawman with an unmatched record of arrests. He was a man who created a legend in his own time, a reputation that assisted him in enforcing the law. He was literally larger than life, both in stature and performance of duty. Speculation that Reeves was the inspiration for the Lone Ranger originally originated in a 2006 biography for, by historian Art T. Burton entitled Black Gun, Silver Star. Burton wrote Bass Reeves is the closest real person to resemble the Lone Ranger. As he documented Reeves' career, Burton engaged in some wish fulfillment perhaps, as he cited many similarities between Reeves and the Lone Ranger. Among them were the use of disguises, making a Native American companion, a white or gray stallion mount, legendary markmanship and horsemanship, and gifts of silver keepsakes. Some of these, like the use of indigenous assistance and silver dollars as payments or tributes were common practices of the US Marshals working in Indian territory. This is Burton's vision of the Lone Ranger. I don't know. I think it's kind of like brown Barbie dolls. Other authors have pointed to Texas Ranger, Captain John R. Hughes as the model for the Lone Ranger because Zane Gray dedicated his book, The Lone Ranger to Hughes and the Rangers in 1915. Hughes was born on February 11th, 1855 in Henry County, Illinois. At age 14, he ended up living among the Choctaw, Osage, and Comanche in Indian Territory. Hughes began his career as a bounty hunter in 1886, tracking down the survivors of a group that had stolen his and a neighbor's horse. After killing the thieves during the theft, he spent months tracking down and killing the others. This activity was not technically outside the law, because death was the customary sentence for horse thieves at the time. In 1887, Hughes helped a Texas Ranger capture and kill an escaped murderer, which led to his joining the Texas Ranger. He rode the Southwest borders of Texas and at age 38, Hughes achieved the rank of captain of Company D of the Frontier Battalion. He served for 28 years, able to capture and kill many criminals without ever being injured. He retired in 1950. Unfortunately, he committed suicide at age 92 
in 1947. So Hughes, too, was a dedicated lawman and more importantly was an actual Texas Ranger who served in Texas. He, too, built a reputation that intimidated outlaws enough for them to plot killing him. He was fluent in the languages of a number of Native American tribes. From the time he spent with them um, early in his life. Well, he shared this skill with Bass Reeves, I'm not sure that it was an ability of the Lone Ranger. I think he used Tonto as a translator. I'm hoping that some one of you will remember. The Lone Ranger was a creature of Detroit radio station WXYZ owner George Trendle and writer Fran Stryker. Their, quote, Mass Rider of the Plains, end quote, de debuted in 1933 to become one of the most popular and enduring Western heroes of the 20th century. Neither of them had any experience with cowboys, Native Americans, or Western pioneers. They simply wanted to create an American version of Zorro the mass swashbuckler played by the silent movie actor, Douglas Fairbank, who was all the rage at the time. They gave their hero a gun instead of a, sword, a sword. Their hero was meant to be a moral example for all children. The Lone Ranger didn't smoke, swear, or drink alcohol. His speech was grammatically correct free of slang, and he never shot to kill. It was a stark contrast to Tonto, who, smoke, who spoke a patois of inauthentic indigenous language and used silly phrases like, you betcha. Tonto's most enduring quality was his undying loyalty to the white man dressed in white. Tonto, who did not appear until the 11th radio episode, was added, added simply to provide something, someone the Lone Ranger could talk to. He was conceived as either Comanche or Potawatomi, primarily because Trindle grew up in Michigan with some interaction with a local Potawatomi tribesman who told him that Tonto meant wild one. Apparently, he was not aware that Italian, Puerto Rican, and Portuguese and Spanish translation of Tonto were a dumb person, moron, or fool. The show was an instant success. Children loved the action sequence and parents approved of the ingrained morality. Once it was syndicated to a nationwide broadcast name, network, Mutual Radio, it was heard by over 20 million Americans three times a week by 1939. An early leader in power marketing tie-ins, the producers licensed manufacturing of Lone Ranger guns, costumes, books largely written by Stryker, comic books, and a popular comic strip. The TV show began in 1949 after the books and became the highest rated television program on ABC in the early 1950s. It was the network's first true hit. It ran for nine seasons between 1949 and 1957. The Lone Ranger's original story was, uh, original story, from the pilot was that he was a one of a group of six Texas Rangers who were ambushed and shot. Although it appeared that they all died, one managed to crawl to a pool where he was found by a Native American, Tonto. He asked Tonto to bury the five other Rangers with the sixth empty grave to make it appear that he was dead. Tonto nursed him back to health. As homage to his ranger brother, also killed in the ambush, 
Tonto fashions a mask for him to disguise himself. The masked man travels with Tonto throughout Texas and across the West to assist victims of the multitude of lawless elements in the territory. Certainly, there are elements of Hughes beginning as a bounty hunter here. When the show became mired in actor disputes, the producers moved from TV to the big screen with color movies in 1956, where it was followed by a couple of other films. Perhaps the most compelling reason that neither Reeves nor Hughes is the model for the Lone Ranger is the fact that the creators were not very likely to have heard of Bass Reeves, any Black Cowboys or Hughes despite the earlier novel. Neither of the show's creator were Wild West buffs, but most importantly, they were drawing on the population of Zorro and his mask, as played by Douglas Fairbanks, to create a commercial product that could be set in an equally adventurous time in the US. The Wild West was a perfect choice. Cowboys, Indians, and outlaws were popular images in American culture. Beyond historical ignorance, the idea of Black heroes was a commercial non-starter in 1933. While Amos and Andy were a radio success, one show about Negroes was probably all the market could bear. Even so, Amos and Andy were conceived and played by white minstrel actors who were just trying to expand their stage careers in 1925. They posed for commercial advertising in blackface as late as 1942. That may sound a bit far afield, but I cite those examples to ground people in the realities of the time in which the show originate and remained on the air. What is clear is that a black lone ranger like the one imagined by Burton would never have been popular in 1933 when the radio show first aired, except perhaps among African-Americans, a fraction of the market. Even a suggestion that he might be based on a black man was a death knell. No studio would have been willing to produce such a show. In popular culture, black men were not supposed to be strong or cunning or to art smart white men. They were not supposed to be better at anything than a white man, except maybe dancing and singing. Black men were never supposed to be heroes. Mr. Burton, having invoked Reeves as the model for the Lone Ranger, was grabbing at straws to rewrite history in ways that it cannot be bent, unless one wants to create, creatively reconstruct it in the tradition of the lost cause, which inverts truth into fiction. Better to recognize Reeves as the legend he is in his own right. Bass Reeves was a bona fide superhero. I close with several images imagined of the U.S. Deputy Marshal. Before I do that, though, I do want to dispel a misrepresentation from Google Images for any of you who might be spurred to do some additional sleuthing. This is Ism Dark. But he can be seen on several sites mistitled Bass Reeves. Granted, he has a mushroom and two pistols holstered with the hands facing forward. But Dart, born Ned Huddleston, was an outlaw, not a lawman. He was a cattle and horse thief who sometimes works as a, as a ranch hand when he wasn't stealing horses and cattle in Mexico to bring back across the border to Texas. He tried to stay on the right side of the law for a while while finally living in Browns Hole, Oklahoma. He was shot dead by Thomas Horn, a self-appointed cattle detective who accused him of a cattle theft 
that ironically, Dart did not commit. From that historical tidbit about black cowboys in the West, I'll turn back to our hero, Bass Reeves, as imagined by Don Gray here, Colin Fleck on the left, and Henry Porter on the right. And I'm hoping somebody out there can tell me whether the Lone Ranger actually spoke to Indians or used Tonto as a translator. I'm sure somebody Here will have go. questions. I see Marilyn's got her hand up. Okay, uh, I do. And I, now I've, I've turned myself off of Zoom somehow. Um, I can't we see the screen. See you. Oh, good, because I can't see anything. I it <laughs> it's sort of crazy. So I'm I'm I I love the idea that he was able to pick up bounties, but I was under the impression that if you were a lawman, that that was your job, and that you couldn't uh, you couldn't collect. Obviously, uh, that's that was just some idealistic thing I had in my mind. I, he, surely he wouldn't have had ten children if he wasn't picking up some extra money <laughs> yeah. along the way. <laughs> and I would yeah. think that the feds would be very happy to pay bounties and not have to pay their, their lawmen so much. Uh, d d is, that, is that so? Am I mistaken in my, my naivete that they did, weren't eligible from, for bounties? No, as far as I know, he, he, his payments were for the people he, he turned in. And, you know, as I said, with uh, Webb's boots, he didn't have to have the person. He just needed um, some proof that uh -huh. the outlaw was dead. Most of the people he returned, he returned them to be tried uh, in court. But yeah, his payment include was specific amounts listed in the warrants when he picked them up. Okay. Well, it was nice. He had a little, he had a cart to carry him around in. You'd think that a lot of people would want to do that. And I guess there were bounty hunters. I mean, we've had, we've had more TV shows about bounty hunters. And, and also I understand there were a lot of black cowboys. That was not yes. an unusual, more than, more than we think, and certainly more than we've been shown in, in movies and TV shows. Yeah, there were a lot of uh, black cowboys. Uh, most we would say that they uh, began as the uh, Buffalo soldiers who were, uh, there were two, there were originally three regiments, but after the, the Civil War, they remained in the army and they were assigned to Indian territory to get rid of the Indians. Um, many of those people and also farmer soldiers moved in a wave of migration out west. Um, and so those men became uh, cowboys. There was okay. also a migration of the formerly enslaved out to new territories where they hoped to start over and uh, claim land. But you know, for the Homestead Act, mostly excluded uh, African Americans. Right. Okay, thank you. Good, good presentation, interesting stuff. Uh, I hope so. Gary, you got a lot of hands. Yeah. Oh, Gary, you've got your hand up. I'm surprised. Yes. Oh, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I, I've followed uh, Western characters for a long time. <clears throat> People like Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday and all of these, uh, Pat Garrett and William Bonney, uh, who's uh, nay uh, Henry McCarty, that was his real name, Billy ah. the Kid, uh, from New York City, by the way. Uh, but this is really fascinating, and uh, I uh, was thinking, you know, how might this be presented in the panoply of Western heroes? 
and characters and historical, real historical characters. And it strikes me the only person that could really approach this uh, is Ken Burns. Uh, I, I just believe that a program Great uh, idea. That he could be really uh, brought out to the fore, but it'd have to be in a the kind of documentary presentation of Ken Burns. Uh, and uh, it would be difficult otherwise, it seems to me, but it really needs to be done in that fashion. And thanks for bringing this up. It gives us a new territory to explore on the Western frontier. I think that's a great idea and I'm pretty sure he'd be interested. Now, does anybody have any uh, in with Ken or could, I, <laughs> you might actually just be able to uh, send it as some kind of suggestion to PBS or NPR, maybe Absolutely. Do, he'll uh, pick up on that. If you're an enthusiasm, enthusiast, oh, you can't see it very well, can you? Here, oh, anyway, if I can only get the title in the, here, Black Cowboys of the Old West. Uh, this is a, thin compilation of some of the other uh, cowboys if you're interested and you know it's it's uh a, um, i guess maybe young adult book it's not dense it's not complex but it's got pictures so that's nice it has pictures of uh the various people it portrays um am i calling people yeah, or I, Anne, are you i am calling okay me? OK. Um, my question probably would, would have preceded um, Carrie's. And that is, you, did I understand correctly that you're about to do a book, or you're in the process of writing a book about this for young adults? Or is this research that you have done uh, out of interest? Um, well, on a product? I, I will tell you, I started um, to do it as a part of a Black History Month thing I was writing a blog and so I thought okay each week during Black History Month I'm going to post some people that nobody knows and so that's why I uh, started looking at it around about it. I have written um, a book called Lesser Known Heroes but I have been unable to find a publisher who is interesting in publishing so you know I've got it in my back and it, you know periodically I rewrite a new book proposal and start sending it out and see if maybe it'll um, tickle somebody's fancy. There are a, a quite a lot of uh, children's books now that hit on uh, some of the people I have profiled. So there are a number of books about Bass Reeves. I showed you one of the titles but um, there, you know, Katherine Johnson, there are another, uh, a bunch of uh, children's books about her as well. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think that sounds like an, I mean, it, it sounds like an interesting project. One, I mean, it, it could be done, I, could, I can picture illustrations if it were done as a children's book or, you know, or, or if you did it as more historical uh, kind of thing for, the, for, for young adults, it sounds, sounds interesting. Yeah, I could picture it as the illustrated as children's books too. <laughs> and I thought, oh, there's a space there because other people are doing it. But mm. you know, I don't know anything about the publishing industry, but I have I haven't figured out well enough to get anything published yet. Not that I've given up, <laughs> but I'm still working it. <laughs> Thanks. Carol? I believe you're up next. Yeah. Okay, I think I'm unmuted. I... You are. Okay. Uh, so I was fascinated by the conference last week that Emory did on slavery and indigenous mm -hmm. erasure, and particularly moved by the uh, panels of young Muskogee <laughs> students mm -hmm. um, who had come to well, as part of the conference, mm -hmm. uh, come to uh, Alabama and Georgia. And you mentioned that Reeves was selected for his knowledge of tribal languages. 
So all of that makes me wonder, can you tell us more about his relationship with the native peoples in the areas where he was working? Uh, I cannot accept to say, well, I, I can say that he did have relationships with uh, various tribes. He um, always had a tribal assistant and at least one other person who went with his little caravan with the cook and the mm -hmm. wagons. Um, I think he may have spent time with them when he was on the road, if he was in an area where he could stay with them. So I think he had fairly friendly uh, relationships with tribesmen. Um, and in some cases, they may have helped him capture some of his, uh, the outlaws, because if they knew that that outlaw was somewhere in their territory, it potentially they could have notified him of that. Well, it strikes me now that we've got Emory students who are uh, working in the archives and working mm -hmm. with the descendants of um, the Muskogee at, at Muskogee University. Uh, well, I guess it's Muskogee Nation University in Oklahoma. And I'll bet some of those students would oh. do some research that would complement yeah. what you have so far to get the fuller picture of the interrelationships. I yeah, no, that's actually a great idea. I, they, they're interesting because they also uh, have been quite involved in uh, oil, having lost their lands to oil speculation and so on and so forth, which took place in the 1910s to maybe 30s uh, when they were first discovered oil. Well, it sounds like Emory has some good connections that would be. Yeah, helpful. yeah. Thank you very much. Interesting. Oh, thank you. And I, I'm going to assign to Gretchen the uh, finding out if the Lone Ranger actually talked <laughs> in Indian dialects or only used Tonto as a uh, translator, since she's such a big uh, Lone Ranger fan. <laughs> um, and also, just to clear up the record, I was practicing in North Carolina just in case South Carolinians might um, be unnerved by the thought that I passed through. Gray, I think he has his hand up. Yes. Thank you so much, Denise. That was really fascinating. Um, I, two things uh, brought up, you know, in early television and, and all the cowboys and Indian stories and how, painful it is to think I, and I grew up watching those shows I watched the Lone Ranger I have no idea I have no memory of whether he spoke Indian languages or not but but really the the painful thought of how those images were were so important in sort of promoting this whole idea of uh, western expansion and underlying white supremacy without being very blunt about it, but all the images and so forth. I mean, I, you know, in thinking about the, the Native Americans and, and what I think real uh, damage was done by all of those images and, and us understanding the real truth of, of American history in that period. But uh, my question is, I was sort of surprised actually that you were able to find so much information about Bass Reeves. I mean, one might have thought that that because he was black, stories would have been sort of, you know, uh, suppressed and information suppressed and so forth. And and do you think, in fact, it was, but that he was so remarkable that that information came out in spite of that? Uh, how? Uh, 
you know, how much information is there about him and how does one, how does one find it? Um, I would say that um, because he was a U.S. Deputy Marshal, the U.S. Deputy uh, Marshal has uh, a museum. They, they have a web page with uh, accounts of their uh, agents. They have, I showed that uh, small card that is sort of like a baseball card that they put out about their uh, deputy. So I think that distinguishes him from the run of the mill cowboy that he did have a presence. And then he also did have a presence in the Muskogee uh, police. Uh, and so I think that's the basis for why there are actual records that you can go back to uh, find out find out about there are um, court records as well for people that he arrested um, and then of course he too was tried so there's a record of his trial as uh, well as his sons and uh, his imprisonment in Leavenworth um, I think that a lot of um, and I didn't do any of that original research, right? I only took from people who wrote about those things. But I do think it, as there is more interest, there will be more people trying to unearth uh, this kind of information. But I think if you've been officially something in government, that's a real key to your surviving as a name going forward. Thank you so much. Sure. I see Gretchen has her hand up. Um, hi, and, and that was wonderful. And, and I, I do want to address the uh, question of um, the possibility of communication between okay. the Lone Ranger and and uh, such natives as you might have encountered. Um, but uh, I've wanted to mention a couple things. First, I love the idea of uh, Ken Burns documentary uh, yeah. being put together, but I, I also wanted to mention um, that our own Patrick Allett, you know, among the, the many, many um, great lectures that he's made available to the general public um, he did one whole series on the American West, did this fairly recently, I think, for, let me see, I've got the information on the uh, screen here, but it, it's, uh, yeah, The Great Courses, um, capital G, capital C, and he's got a 24-episode series on the American West mm -hmm. on uh, uh, fiction uh, and fact right? Uh, both, as it says, the heroic idea uh, of it and the more complex historical reality. Anyway, that, that sounds quite wonderful, and you might, uh, all of us who are interested might want to check that out. Was uh, that part of uh, great courses? You know, there right. is, the, uh -huh. yeah, so that's, that's yeah. you can go there and find it. Right, that's there, uh, and uh, just, uh, actually, I think if you Google Patrick Allen, it will pop right up. He did so many sequences of many, many uh, lectures for great courses. And, and this is one of the subjects um, that he pursued. Um, I also wanted to mention, um, I found this out when I was checking into what Patrick's been up to lately. And I think John Jurasek may, may still be with us and may know this and others of you may know that Emory has just hired a woman who's a specialist whose special area of expertise is uh, American Indian history, if we can use that language. I never know what's politically correct anymore. But uh, she's been brought in as a full professor, a named full professor. Um, the Cahoon family professorship, Patrick holds uh, one of those positions, and we've brought in this woman. And I, I think she's been brought in from maybe from Oklahoma anyway. Uh, a woman who's already got uh, 
you know, a, a long history of teaching and, and lecturing publication, but she's with us and I have my eye on her. She doesn't know it yet. Oh, good. But I, I thought she'd be a good one to invite to come talk to us in the spring. Okay, now this is actually my, my question, not just for Denise, but for all of you who remember um, the radio show and the TV show, I sure do. Uh, I never minded being homesick because I would get to listen to the radio show uh, and uh, eventually get to watch the TV show. Um, it's my impression, I wonder about the rest of you, that other than Tonto, he really didn't communicate much with right. native peoples, right? I mean, it seems to me that usually the bad guys he was chasing were white guys, right? Uh, and who were uh, taking advantage of white people. Uh, and and uh, what I wonder, I mean, of course, we all, we little kids at the time, we all play cowboys and Indians. And, um, and I'm afraid the Indians were always the villains, right? <laughs> and nobody wanted to be an Indian, but people had to be so they could die. Uh, but I'm wondering about the portrayal of the good relationship, really the support of the friendly relationship between the Lone Ranger and Tonto. Uh, you know, whether maybe that would actually work counter to the general impression that you know, the Indians were the villains and, and to be done away with at every opportunity. I don't know. Well, to my mind, um, that's just an example like the exceptional Negro, right? Yeah. There, the there's one or two good ones out there. If you find them, yeah. But the rest of them, you have to assume that they are not one of the good guys. Okay, right? and, it, and in most approaches, that's what happens, right? You encounters are always like the white man's on his guard until the Indian can demonstrate that they're not going to hurt them in some way or another. What, and you know that may have been practical. If if you think about the circumstances, in the uh -huh. West, it probably was. Right, they could easily just jump you. Um, without knowing. The other thing is I do think that the emphasis for the show Lone Ranger, at least the way it was conceived, was that he was helping victims, right? Hmm. He's really all, of, he wasn't like going around just trying to chase outlaws per se. He wasn't acting like a lawman. Yeah, yeah. That's His right. job was to save victims. And that you know, sort of has that same connotation as Zorro, right? As he was a man of the people, you know, or in the tradition of Robin Hood, right? Those heroes who were really for the common man. Yeah, I, a lot of those TV shows, those those early westerns, um, yeah, the, the the cowboy heroes worn out just to to uh kill kill they were they were often helping yeah. victims right i remember uh maybe it came along hey, a little later, but right. have gone will travel you know paladin right uh, acting as a sort of knight in the service of those who needed his help that sort of thing yeah right and the only you know the only people who did track down um thieves were the marshals Right, so there, mm -hmm. if, if it was about a uh, sheriff, then their role. But again, they typically did it only in the response to an attack. You know, like mm -hmm. they outlaws came in and shot up the town, or there were cattle rustlers somewhere, and so they would have to go chase them down. It was all about defense of the weaker people, the unarmed people. Right, and I think even when it came to armed conflict, uh, that most of these good guys were sharp shooters, right? And, and they wouldn't shoot somebody through the heart and that was it. They, they would shoot right. the gun out of his hand, right? Right, uh, the Lone Ranger specifically him. did not kill people. That's right. He only, he only wounded people. Um, I, and I, you know, I will say that, <laughs> These shows 
are just a reflection of the general social cultural environment. Yeah, yeah. It really wasn't that um, the images influenced the public. It's that the public influenced the images, right? Yeah, and, yeah. Right? Right. They just were, this is what people thought. Yes, it was a reinforcing cycle, much like Fox TV. <laughs> you know, if you listen, you keep imbibing it, but it just reinforces what everyone thought. Um, well, and I do wonder anyway. if, you know, given the portrayal of Tonto as, as uh, one of the super good guys, um, the portrayal of his speech habits, his inability to put together a, a, an English sentence uh, was somehow a way to modulate the impression, I mean, as you said, yes. when I told Delia Nesbitt, one of our own, whom, whom you will, will know, many of you who grew up in Italy and taught Italian for us, um, uh, knew immediately when I, I said you were going to be talking about this, she said, oh, tanto, tanto. Uh, I said, yeah, yeah. why, what? And she said what you said, right? That any Italian would know immediately that means he's an idiot. And I said, right. well, he doesn't come across as an idiot. He's, he's smart really, um, but he can't talk very well. <laughs> yeah, but not, you know, even in that, I think he mostly did what he was told. Yes. Um, yeah. he, he, he didn't like initiate things. And I think, again, it's that limitation that says, well, he might be an exceptional one, but he still ain't good as the rest of us, right? Whether his limitation is language or whatever. Uh, do, you remember watching, do you remember watching the Lone Ranger yourself? Yes, you I did. Know? I did watch. I don't think that I it made any good impression. I, you know, growing up in Ohio, I also was a big fan of Roy Rogers and Dale oh Lennon. yeah, and actually met uh, Pat. You know, who had the Jeep, the. Jeep oh there. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I actually met Pat and the Jeep at the Ohio State Fair uh, when I was a kid. Um, <laughs> I feel like Dale Evans might have been gonna be there or something, and instead it would turn out to be Pat. Uh, that's kind of the way I remember it from I don't know age twelve or whatever it was. Well, at but, least there were cowgirls as well as cowboys, right? Yeah, right. Uh, a move in the right direction. <laughs> right. The question is, did she actually do anything other than cook <laughs> and ride horses? <laughs> you know, if you horse? really get down to it, what did Dale Evans do? Right, right. She rode a horse called Buttermilk. I remember yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> she did. In a skirt, I think. She was in a skirt. I mean, you know. Yes. That's Right, right, yep. yes. Oh, yes. She was, she you was think married she to, to ride side saddle in a skirt, but apparently she, was she married to Roy Rogers, <laughs> Dale Evans and Roy Rogers. That's why what Dale did. I mean, she was his wife, and the two of them appeared together, and she had cute boots and hair, and uh, I mean, they were a couple. So she wasn't just out there on her own. There were. Did, did she sing too? Yes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, okay. I couldn't remember whether she sang. I mean, so many of them did sing, it seems. And they had a child with Down syndrome, and she wrote a book about her called Angel Unawares, and oh, which was rather famous. Yeah, I mean, they, they were they were citizens, you know, they were real people. Oh, yeah. But does anybody but me know what Roy Rogers' real name was? No. I so enjoyed this when we were working with, you know, studying connotations of language and in connection with people changing their names. His real name was Leonard Sly. Uh, yes. Oh no. Yes, right? Yes, yes, uh, Carrie, you you with your interest in these figures would know these things. Uh, but Isn't I have wonderful? a, I, uh, so Gretchen, let me add this. I know the guy who's, whose name, I know the Rogers that he stole his name from. He was a physician that worked at Mayo Clinic. Actually, it may have been his father that, that Leonard Sly took the name Roy Rogers from, <laughs> but he was the third Roy Rogers of the name, the, the physician I knew, and he went by Nick. 
So Nick Rogers, his real oh. name was Roy. And I asked him about the cowboy and he said, yeah, yeah, he took my dad's name. So that's yeah, kind no of interesting. Kidding. Right. Well, imagine if he tried to make it as Leonard Sly and Dale Evans. I don't think yeah. so. No. <laughs> no. And Gene Autry, gosh. Oh, yes. I was, I was just thinking to you because when you, uh, oh, God, I just got hit with this happy trails to you. Right. <laughs> and till we meet again. Anyway. Right. Um, <laughs> so when you said a lot of them sang, that was the next thing that came up was Gene Autry. Right, right. Yeah, what, what shows others of you that are here with us, and, and you know, we've got eight minutes left, um, what early Western shows did you watch and, and love or, or maybe hate? Well, you know, the uh, the king of the, of the ball uh, in those days was Hopalong Castle. Oh, oh gosh. Uh, Hoppy uh, was, I don't know, the grandfather of them all, you know, in some ways. William uh, William Boyd. Right. The, uh, yes. I, they had a savings account uh, at our bank, and you could sign up and be one of Hoppy's Hoppy's kids or something like that. And anyway, I was a great admirer of Hopalong Cassidy. My mother said, well, he's old. And I yeah. said, what? He said, yes, his hair is gray. And I said, no, it's blonde, it's blonde. So I was a, I, I was a firm believer in, uh, what, do you remember his horse's name? Topper. There you go, Topper, that's right, absolutely. Oh, wow. This, this is degenerated, yeah, yeah. Did Denise he not has begin brought out as a, a radio show as well. Hopalong and Cassidy was he yes, not? I was that so. not a radio show? Yeah, yeah. I think I they think all so. were. I mean, that's how they got in because there oh, was yeah, a television. Dean Autry, definitely. I'm pretty sure Dean Autry was. Well, that's a good question. There, there was also Tom Mix. Now, are you missing yeah. Tom Mix? Oh yeah. But then we got but the that northern. That was movies. Then Wasn't we got movies? The, the northern Yukon King. Well, I first encountered him just on radio because we didn't have a uh, TV until 1955. And so in the early fifties, we would listen to Tom Mix and, uh, and the Lone Ranger, but also the Yukon King then came, uh, it took us further North. Did you hear that? And don't forget the Cisco Kid oh, yeah. and Sky King. That's Sky King. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what about Wanted Dead or Alive? Steve McQueen. The, Cis oh. the Cisco kid had uh, Poncho was his side sidekick. Remember? Oh, yeah. Yes. Hey, Cisco, hey, Cisco. Hey, Poncho. Let's Hi, let's win. Yeah. <laughs> Cisco. Yeah. You remember the name of Tonto's horse? What? Oh, what shoot! I... Scout. Oh, yeah. that's right. <laughs> I, I coached college bowl for many years uh, when I was teaching um, and, and those kinds of pop culture questions would come up mixed in with all the serious stuff. See, but, that uh, just meant that his horse was really the aid in moving around because his horse was carrying a fool, right? <laughs> if you take his name, <laughs> a fool right. atop a real scout. <laughs> Oh, I guess Gunsmoke and, uh, didn't come along in the early 50s. I, I think no, it, it, was, it was definitely later. A little later. Yeah. But you know, there were- but, You know, there old... were movies like Shane. Oh, Shane. What was that, like 50 or something? High, Shane, high yes. Noon? You could put High Noon also oh, in that uh, Yes, Gary Cooper. <laughs> yeah. Mm -mm. Yeah. And I, I, I know these old shows, uh, the, the person I co-edit a journal with um, watches the old cowboy shows in the middle of the night. You know, he, he'll write me Rawhide. He wrote me a oh, lot yeah. of the other. Rawhide. Uh, yeah, Rawhide. Rolling. Rawhide. Rolling. Rawhide. Yeah. Right. But uh, uh, so. Did Zorro come along at this around. time? Huh? Was it Clint Eastwood oh. in Rawhide? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Was like yeah. that was the beginning of uh, Clint Eastwood. So yeah. I, that's an interesting question. Zorro, the TV show, I feel like was 
maybe later than that. Yeah. Yeah, right. I and I'd also like to think I don't know if anybody saw the more recent remakes of the Lone Ranger. Johnny Depp. Johnny, Johnny right, Depp. It seems from the photographs that that was like way out there in some other place. It was way right? out it, there. It was it seemed very dark. Um, but there was wasn't uh, Army Hammer in one as well. As as the Lone Ranger. Yeah. I mean, Johnny Depp played Tonto in, in one of right. them. That and, that, and that really seemed weird. really weird. I, I'm not sure what they were trying to say. If you look about the implications for society and how it reflects social, cultural milieu, I'm not sure what it was trying to say, except sort of to be less um, anti-Native American, although you have to point out right off, well, Johnny Depp's not a Native American, right? <laughs> if you're gonna be anti-Native American, you could at least get a Native American actor, of which right. there are some, right? Rather than somebody like Johnny Depp. Uh, by the way, there was a hierarchy of uh, sidekicks, as you'll recall. That is, Gabby Hayes would turn up oh. as about three different of cowboys sidekicks and you always wondered how he kind of evolved into different <laughs> uh, uh, cowboys lives you know right. Gabby Hayes but you're all ignoring my favorite semi-hero Maverick oh yeah which one Brett first by okay. far. <laughs> Yeah, oh yeah, those, and I guess those came along uh, later too. Uh, late not, late yeah. 50s, late 50s yeah. to early 60s. The Rifleman, you remember the oh, Rifleman? Oh yes, Chuck. Chuck Connors. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and I, I guess the Western as a genre has just uh, gone away, except for the old shows uh, being shown. Um, but maybe it will return. I guess it's just I fraught with issues now somebody actually said they wanted to make a west somebody like steven spielberg or you know some great uh director i heard recently said he wanted to make a western but i don't know that that's ever going to happen or the form in which it happens i think will be different from how we thought about westerns before and that will depend on whether they think it'll be popular. You know what I mean? It's like they don't make movies in Hollywood unless they think somebody's going to watch them and right. nobody watches them, which also raises an interesting question. I don't know if there are things like Chinese Westerns, right? So we had The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, uh, with Sergio Leone did Italian oh. Westerns, right? He did five of those. Are there Chinese Westerns? Well, how about don't... something like the samurai um, in, in Japan? I mean, were the samurai kind of cowboy heroes? No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> they, they, yeah, they didn't do things with regular people. They, they okay. actually were a warrior class, you know? Okay. I guess I'm thinking of, you know, the seven samurai and then the magnificent seven. Yeah, right. Um, right. And now, I, I mean, a lot of the tropes have moved from the Western to, well, you know, from the frontier, our frontier to space, the final yes. frontier, you know. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. That's, a, that's our next iteration is sort of, we're moving the to space. I think most people are just trying not to think about uh, climate change. Yeah. They want to be in a world that where it's not concerned about that. It's either that or what we're going to do after the planet comes to an end, right? That's the other theme of a lot of apocalyptic things, you know, which yeah. are meant to project we'll survive as a species even after we've destroyed the planet, right? <laughs> Well, this was fun, wasn't it? Yeah, it did turn out to be quite fun. Yeah. 
I'm glad you think so. I know I twisted your arm into doing this, Denise. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fun. I always love talking. I do. <laughs> I definitely got an invitation because we didn't have a TV until the 60s and we were only allowed to watch educational TV. So I didn't hear or see any of these shows that people. Oh, watched. gosh. Well, it's not too late, Anne. I don't have a TV now. So. Oh, gee. Uh -oh. Speaking of aliens. Well, it's okay. You don't need a TV. From? You <laughs> don't need a TV anymore. Yeah, There's the internet. YouTube. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Then like I would bet they're all out there on the internet. You just have to go look for them. Or they're probably, they'll be streaming through Netflix or some of those yeah. uh, mm -hmm. platforms. So. Right. I do love this idea of the Ken Burns project, though. I, just I can't believe he hasn't done it already, you know? I think that would be incredibly fascinating. It takes him so long to do his stuff. Who knows that he might still be working on it, because they do That's it. That's right. He'll take two years. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, the wonderful Lewis and Clark thing he did involved a lot of um, portrayal of, of Indians and of the Lewis and Clark experience with Indians mm -hmm. along the way and uh, Sacagaway and all that. There's got to be some myth making in that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, guys. All right. I guess that's it. Oh, I do also, I do just want to put a plug in for uh, Susan Soper. I'm someone who takes her memoir kit classes um, at Ollie, and they are really wonderful. She has, uh, what she does is uh, send out a little prompt for different subjects that you can approach, and then you can draw from your own life to, you know, talk about that. Things like uh, uh, what's... Uh, what happened in your cafeteria or talk about uh, first loves or, you know, a sports experience, things that are designed to trigger and so she'll focus on different times. So sometimes it'll be childhood, other times it'll be more adult. It's, it's very fascinating and the, um, writings of people in the group a lot of whom tend to be the same are, are really very interesting yeah patty owen smith our own patty uh has taken yes. classes yeah. with susan too and and says the same as you just said denise yeah Thank and you. her pieces are always so wonderful <laughs> It sounds like next okay week. and remember that's a tuesday uh tuesday the 19th not the monday but you'll get a newsletter in the meantime to remind you about it yeah. Right. And if anyone's thinking they can want to check out her course, particularly after she talks, you can always go on Ollie and sign up for it. Okay. Are you going to be teaching um, an Ollie course this time around? No, I am not. <laughs> but Denise has done what? One or two at least. Uh, I, four or something like sure. that. I, but who's counting? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. No, I decided I was going to concentrate on my... Uh, book my novel writing and I actually I'm at the end of that and sort of uh you know just doing edits before I start throwing it out into the universe universe I don't know that we know about this what is your your novel oh, oh so I've like, written a novel about my experiences in North Carolina actually all right so okay it's about practicing as a general OBGYN in what could the highest level would be a level one hospital with very few resources in a majority black county in North Carolina um, in the late 80s. Um, I've actually always wanted to write about my patients who still live with me, uh, kind of the terrible things that happened to them in terms of disease and just, uh, I, in looking back, I think I left that experience actually depressed because I owned a lot of the bad outcomes. I felt like somehow I hadn't done the right thing or, you know, so I'm so, I sort of try to work through that um, idea in the novel, so. 
I'm hoping well, this will be my, and then see, somebody said to me, if you get that published, then you'll have no problem with your uh -huh. um, hero's book, right? Because once you publish something, then it's much easier to publish something else, so. Well, maybe some of us will have advice for you on, on finding a venue for for the novel to begin with, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm happy to send you uh, a few sample chapters if you wanna read them and welcome the input.